Hi, I'm your host, Anand J. Sukadia, and this is the Limitless One Podcast. Join me on this journey as I interview the most inspirational souls who are tapping into their limitless blueprint on a mental, physical, and spiritual level to thrive in uncertain times. If you feel you are so much more than just this body, just this life, and want to tap into your limitless potential, you're in the right place. Here we go, Starseeds. Are you thinking about becoming an entrepreneur and starting a new business? Wait just a minute, because we're going to be learning about the biggest pitfalls new business owners face and how to set up your business for maximum success. Welcome to the Limitless One podcast, everyone. I am your host, Anand J. Sukadia. Today, we are blessed to have a business expert, attorney, and consultant to help us navigate through the uncharted waters of entrepreneurship. Trevor Anderson has a wealth of experience and insight representing and advising businesses and entrepreneurs of all sizes on both legal and strategic matters. Trevor advised and guided Fortune 100 companies on business issues ranging from performance optimization, development, and execution of strategic initiatives, and analyzing business risks. He currently provides advisory and legal work on a range of business issues, including entity formation, corporate governance, contract negotiations, mergers, acquisitions, divestitures, and investor relations. Trevor is singularly focused on providing massive value to his clients by providing legal solutions that are sensitive to and promote their business goals. He believes business business founders, owners, and executives can fully realize the purpose of their businesses and leave a positive, lasting mark on society. Welcome to the podcast, Trevor. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Anon. It's been a while. Yeah, I know. I, last time I saw you, your hair was a lot shorter. <laughs> I know. I've got I've got the COVID mullet going on back here. So I think it's here to stay, though. <laughs> awesome. Whatever you're doing, keep on doing it. Yeah, so I, I know Trevor, uh, for all the listeners out there, we were in the same networking group for about a year and a half, two years. Uh, it's called BNI International. Um, Trevor was our business attorney, and there was so much knowledge that he was able to provide on a day in and day out basis. And I wanted to get him on today because I know a lot of people out there, especially these days during COVID, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. And there's a lot of my friends and listeners that are looking to start their own side hustles, their own businesses. And I want to make sure that everyone out there looking to start something is going to start off on the right foot. Because as an entrepreneur for a very long time, I started out and I made a lot of mistakes and I had a lot of, uh, you know, things that I wish I didn't do in the beginning and wish I had done to kind of like put myself in the right place. But uh, you're, you're the guy to talk about it. So let's, uh, let's get right into it. Trevor, what does living a limitless life mean to you? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, it's always great to have these conversations with you. I definitely have enjoyed them in the past. So I'm looking forward to this. Um, yeah, limitless life for me, it's pretty simple. It's, um, you know, living a life that's sort of free of fear, um, you know, and having an abundance mindset, you know, it, it, it's really removing the barriers for becoming, you know, the best version of what I can be, you know, and for me, that looks like um, being able to experience growth and change, you know, in my own life and, you know, me and me as a person. And also contributing to, you know, the, uh, the quality of life of those around me, right? Like that's, that's kind of my mission is to improve the quality of life of, you know, everyone in my surrounding. Beautiful. Now, what does growth and change mean to you? Yeah, it's, uh, it means that when I wake up 10 years from now, I don't want to be the same person that I am today. You know, obviously core beliefs, principles, you know, those are things that I want to to use to guide my life. But, you know, I think that the biggest shortfall sometimes in living a life is being static, right? Like there's, full, there's tons of experiences, there's new ideas out there constantly changing and evolving. And I think, you know, as a person really feel, living a fulfilled and content life, like you've got to evolve too. And that's, that's the growth, right? That's, that's the change that I'm talking about. 
Beautiful. Yeah, I really believe that uh, everything in this world, in this life is energy and energy just can't remain static because it needs to express itself in whichever wave, whichever form, you know, the ocean is never static and still yeah. it has to move in order to create more life and to create, you know, beauty that, that it does. So um, I think that our lives are the same way. The moment that we start kind of living into a little box and then repeating the same things on auto mechanism, that's when our growth in life, that's when our happiness, that's when our drive stops, you know, yeah. stops, uh, you know, getting created. And then we start like living a life where we're just kind of like on a parachute and we're just like slowly, you know, <laughs> descending yeah. into, you know, it's a not very really interesting life, but um, I, yeah. I, I agree. I mean, it's, um, I think it can even be worse than that, right? Like, you know, we all have these, uh, fear of uncertainty, right? To test our boundaries, to like really extend ourselves past our comfort zone. Um, but that's how you grow, right? That's how you change. And once you stop doing that, you know, it's like these concentric circles that just get smaller and smaller in your life, right? You keep, you know, new boundaries start getting smaller because you're afraid to extend yourself. And all of a sudden, a life that you're living that is out here is now, you know, this, you know, in your experiences and, uh, you know, sort of the things that you're getting out of life diminish. So I want to fight that with all my, all my energy and all my power. <laughs> Absolutely. And I tell my friends, whenever I recommend uh, you to, to, to work with Trevor is like, you know, you're the least or, or the most non lawyer 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 that I know. <laughs> Like you're growth minded. A lot of times, you know, a lot of attorneys are very risk adverse and they're telling you not to do a lot of things versus you are showing people how they can kind of expand it and grow, which I love that mindset. And that's why I love, uh, love working with you and love recommending people to, to work with you. Now let's get into your story. Um, tell us about your, your background and how you got to this place in your career. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have, I guess what I would consider a, a, a non-traditional background, right? To, to get into where I am. I, I recently launched a law firm uh, like eight months ago, uh, the Anderson firm. But um, prior to that, you know, I was an undergrad. I was a philosophy major. Um, you know, as, uh, as my father always told me, you have two choices, right? It's like law school, or you can ask people if they want fries with that. <laughs> so only two things you can do with that degree. Um, you know, so I was like, oh, hey, a lawyer, that's a respectable career. Uh, you know, let me study for the LSAT, get into law school. I got into a pretty good law school, um, did all right in it, and uh, got onto this conveyor belt, right? Out of law school, joined a firm doing uh, insurance defense work, which, uh, you know, for people who do that, you know, more power to you. It just wasn't for me because uh, I was working, you know, on behalf of these giant insurance companies and not really feeling fulfilled. Um, you know, so I took a break from practicing law and, uh, I joined Ernst and Young as a consultant. So, you know, I moved from Atlanta to Charlotte, then up to New York, um, and was working for these large, you know, multinational financial institutions, right. Banks, asset management companies, you know, the Wells Fargo's of the world and Goldman and things like that. And, uh, you know, I did that for almost three years and, and really enjoyed the problem solving component of it. But again, you know, there was this urge of feeling like I was, I needed to help people. Like I wanted to assist real people and, you know, moving paper around or, you know, making a few extra bucks or saving a few extra bucks for these companies that make billions of dollars just wasn't hitting that need for me. Uh, so I left that and uh, went back to practicing law. And uh, yeah, I was doing that for about two years before I decided to start my own firm. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the decision why you decided to start your own firm versus working with, uh, you know, your previous uh, firm that you're working? Absolutely. So it, it's, it's an interesting story, but it's a very defining moment for me. I, um, you know, I was from the outside, like a very successful person, right? I was an attorney. I was working at a, as a consultant for a big four uh, accounting firm, you know, all, all titles that, you know, when you're young, like, oh, you should aspire to do this, you know? Um, but I just, I wasn't satisfied with it, but I didn't really know why, you know, I was just going through the motions, um, you know, be like, oh, society tells me like, if I'm a lawyer, 
I am an associate and I should try to make partner at a law firm. And like, that's the end goal, right? To make partner. And um, I was doing that, right? Because I didn't know any difference. And I wasn't really listening to myself and, and sort of the warning signs. But, um, you know, back in 2018, I found out that I had an underlying heart condition, um, you know, causing like an, an uh, irregular rhythm. So I was scheduled to go in for a procedure to, uh, to get it corrected, a, a cardiac ablation. And, um, you know, they put me under anesthesia. I'm in the hospital. Thank God I was in the hospital. Um, but as the cardiologist gets in there, they realize there's a bunch more issues going on with my heart than they thought it was too dangerous to do the procedure. So they back out, right. They don't, they don't perform it. Um, but that day, you know, when I woke up from anesthesia about a minute later, um, my heartbeat stopped. I actually went flat line, uh, no pulse, no nothing for 59 seconds, just nothing. And, um, I woke up to, you know, this, this tech basically on my chest, doing chest compressions, yelling at me, trying to like bring me out of it. And there I was, you know, um, (laughs) for no apparent reason, my heart started again. And, uh, from that moment on, well, first of all, I didn't know what the hell to do. (laughs) Like I had never experienced something like that before. Um, I had no idea how to interpret it. It shook me to my core. I actually took two weeks off from work, uh, went to a cabin in upstate New York and just like reflected on life and what I wanted. And, um, you know, I realized that I was on a dead end path for me. You know, I was pursuing a career that was one, probably killing me with stress. And two, I didn't really want the end goal. You know, I looked at the lives, the lot of the partners at the firm as I was living, I didn't want that, you know? And so I had to really strip things down to get to the essence of what motivated me, um, what drove me, my, my why, right? If you're a cynic fan. Um, And I realized that, you know, what gets me up every morning is a desire to help people unlock their potential and live fulfilled lives for themselves. And so from that moment on, I knew I was never going to be, you know, a partner at a big law firm uh, or anything like that. I had to strike my own path. Now it took me, you know, two years to get things going and get the infrastructure in place to be able to launch this firm. Um, You know, and in the meantime, I, you know, dabbled in performance coaching. I did some consulting work on the side um, because all of those things were tools to try to help me achieve my why. And now I bring those into my law firm. Amazing. Wow. 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 So if we could just backtrack a little bit, when you yeah. were flatlined for 59 seconds, do you remember what you were thinking, where you were, were you just gone? It was it like black space. Like what was the. Yeah. I, I get asked this question a, a bunch. Um, Cause I didn't believe it at first. I actually had like weeks later, I had them print out like the EKG strips because for me, it felt like it was just a brief moment, right? I remember waking up out of anesthesia, you know, laying in the recovery bed. And I remember sitting up and saying, I don't feel so good. And then from there, like uh, if anyone's sort of like blacked out or pat, like passed out before you get this tunnel vision and then just goes black. And then I honestly, I don't remember a single thing until I could hear like a ringing in my ears and then someone's voice screaming my name over and over. And that's when I opened my eyes and saw um, the the nurse doing compressions on top of me. Wow. wow. Yeah, it's, it's, it's wild. Uh, family was there. They're all crying. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure why it was uh, it was traumatic for some <laughs> for some of us. <laughs> Yeah, now it's it's so apparent that you know when you when you're faced with death, that's when you know you truly want to start living and appreciating every moment. You know, a lot of times we'll we'll go through life and and we don't have that same appreciation. So I mean, you know, I probably look at what happened to you as a blessing, and so do you. Um, Absolutely. You know, to propel you in in every day and just being more present in in each experience, every moment that that you have. Uh, present and intentional, right? Because 
it's so like everything in our society is sort of designed to just sweep you up in momentum, you know, down a path, um, you know, whether it's in a career, you know, or it's, you know, this idea that it's, oh, you know, you have to get married, buy a house, have a kid like this. And then you work for 40 years and then you retire. Like this whole mindset has a ton of momentum. And if you're not actively asking questions on it um, or trying to change the narrative, that's the life you'll live. And, you know, that's great for some folks, you know, there's nothing wrong with it, but if it's not right for you, you know, that's where you really, you know, that's what opened my eyes, right. Is I, I needed to have this massive wake up call that was just like, Trevor, like this isn't right for you. You need to change something. You need to do something. Mm -hmm. Um, And so now, you know, my mission is to help people get to that point without having to, you know, die <laughs> first. <laughs> Maybe that should be part of your mission statement before you die, yeah. have to live. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Amazing, dude. So yeah, let's let's uh, move a little bit into you know the um, the services that you offer at your law firm, um, and let's go into also like uh, some of the stuff you know some of the common pitfalls that you can face in business and some of the the things that you really need to do to to prepare yourself. Absolutely. So you know. I always say that I, I help create the foundation for small businesses and entrepreneurs to achieve their strategic goals. Um, you know, what does that tagline mean? You know, really it is that when you're an entrepreneur, right, you have an idea, it's your baby, right? Like you want to bring this idea to fruition and there are a million things out there waiting to undermine you, to sap your energy, um, you know, and basically prevent you from getting there. And my job um, is I bring, you know, the legal expertise, the coaching and consulting together to get basically help you eliminate those, those obstacles um, and, and achieve those goals. So, you know, it's really a combination of things. I, I like to start working with small businesses and entrepreneurs really at any stage of their business, but the earlier, the better. Um, because, you know, as you know, Anon, like there's a ton of paperwork that goes with starting a company, right? You need to form an entity with, you know, whatever state you're operating in. If you're operating in multiple states, you have to register in multiple states. You have to decide, hey, am I going to be a partnership, you know, if I'm with another person, am I going to be a, an LLC? Am I going to be a corporation? Um, you know, so I help them make those decisions because each decision has different trade-offs, right? Benefits and consequences, and it can impact, right? Your ability to grow, um, your ability to expand, to bring on investors, things like that. So, you know, I help with sort of the beginning of the life cycle. And then there's a ton of advisory work, you know, after that understanding what people's goals are, you know, what are you trying to achieve? Um, And that's kind of where the coaching and consulting part of things kick in is um, helping you be laser focused on, on achieving those things. Um, You know, and then obviously I do, I do things like if you're looking to buy other businesses, um, helping to structure that, figuring out um, the risks associated with that. Also, um, you know, where you can get, uh, you know, economy needs a scale or, or, you know, unlock additional profits or uh, performance and things like that. So um, yeah, this is sort of along the whole life, life cycle of a business. Yeah, definitely. You know, I've never had an attorney or even an accountant ask me what my business goals are. They're like, okay, just send me the information and, you know, I'll either incorporate for you or I'll do your taxes. There's no, there's no added value yeah. in helping me structure myself for success. And- that's a problem, yeah. right? Like, I think that that's a serious problem because if you are a professional, you know, in, in my position, right, a lawyer, you know, my job is to make sure that you are successful as an entrepreneur. Like, that's my job. It's not to just draft contracts. That's part of it, right? That's part of the protection. Um, but really, it's to help you achieve your dreams, right? Achieve your goals. If I'm not doing that, you know, or if your lawyer or accountant or professional is not helping you get there, they're doing you a disservice, right? You're just writing a check for them for, you know, 
whatever, they can be great attorneys, great accountants, you know, great contracts that they're putting together, but they're not going that extra mile for you. Um, you know, when I was doing the coaching work and I, I sort of organized this idea around three principles or, or three pillars, right? And that's every small business, every entrepreneur needs to have a vision, right? Of what they're trying to accomplish. It needs to be more than just making money, right? Because how do you get other people motivated to work for you and with you if the whole idea is just to put dollar bills in your pocket, right? It only goes so far. Uh, the next thing is that you need to have a culture of dignity, right? Treating your, your peers, your employees, your customers and clients with like humans, <laughs> right? Not inputs and outputs, um, you know, and then the last thing is obviously you have to deliver with consistency without consistency, like everything else is lost. Um, so I bring those three principles into, you know, all the advice that I give to, to entrepreneurs. Um, and that's really where, you know, helping to create a culture comes into play, right? And that, that dictates success. Beautiful. I, I love the, the whole part of vision and, you know, especially, you know, this is, uh, I guess, three and a half years now into my business, but yeah. just constantly making sure my team knows what our purpose and our vision is and to do that within every aspect of the business, you know, uh, we're all about, you know, helping and inspiring true health in our community yeah. and the planet. And that goes with every action, whether they're, you know, cleaning a float tank or whether they're interacting with a guest, we, we make sure on a daily basis, we're discussing this because, you know, once, once it's ingrained in that culture, then yeah, then everyone else begins to understand it with the customers that come through and they leave like, you know, glowing reviews, five-star reviews is because they understand what our mission is. And, you know, it's pretty much everywhere throughout our business. It, and that's, that's awesome because that's what you need, right? You need it to permeate everything that you do. There's this, there's this great story uh, floating out there. I don't know if it's true or not, um, but like in the, the 60s during the, the space race, um, there's this reporter like, you know, like floating around NASA trying to interview anyone to get details about, you know, the moon launch and things like that. And finally, like she came across this guy. It's like, hey, do you mind? Do you work for NASA? He's like, yes. Do you want to answer some questions? Of course. He's like, you know, the reporter asked this guy, you know, what are you guys doing here? And he's like, we're sending people to the moon. Like, that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And she's like, oh, that's awesome. You know, thinking it's some sort of engineer or something like that. And, she, you know, the reporter's like, well, what's your job here? It's like, oh, I'm a custodian. Mm -hmm. Like the, the, the person who's sweeping up the floors had bought into the mission because, you know, that, that vision was so strong in the organization that top to bottom, you know, side to side, everyone was on the same page. And that's how we, you know, made it happen. Beautiful. I love that story. <laughs> so do I, yeah. dude. So what would you say to somebody? Because I know a lot of people out there that they want to do something, whether consultant work or, you know, side gigs, and they're like, okay, I'm not going to incorporate it right now because, you know, it's an investment, but I'll just start accepting payments to my personal account. People can Venmo me. And then later on, I will, you know, I'll maybe like do it the yeah. right way and incorporate what would you say to somebody who's kind of beginning, starting out, thinking of making a decision like that? Yeah, be very, very careful. There's a lot of risks associated with that. Um, you know, being a sole proprietor is definitely easy, right? On the paperwork side of things, because it's just you. Um, but that comes with a lot of risk. You know, when you are operating in that capacity, you know, you don't get the benefit of protection when things go wrong. You know, let's say, let's say you are acting as a consultant, right? And you're a sole proprietor. You, um, you give advice to a company that turns out to not work well, and maybe they lose a bunch of profits as a result of it. That company is probably going to sue you. And if you're a sole proprietor, they get to access not only the company's assets, but your personal assets, right? If you, you cars, homes, savings, like you name it, they get their hands on it. So that's the last thing that we want. However, if you were to form an entity, LLC, corporation, 
a lot of what that company could get after in a lawsuit stops with the company's assets, right? They don't get after your personal assets, which is huge, right? Because you got to protect, you got to protect your life, your family, you know, whatever it is, Um, because you can always start new businesses, you can always start new ventures. But if something comes through and wipes you out, even on a personal level, like it's, it's tough to recover from that. Yeah, definitely. I actually, I actually, I no, I've got a great story for this. I like a a client um, I used to have. It was uh, it was two brothers who wanted to start a business, uh, like fish wholesale sales, right? Random business, but they started it. uh, You know, it's two brothers, they're family, right? They don't need an entity. They don't need an operating agreement. They don't need a partnership agreement. Whatever it is, they're fine, right? Um, you know, for like 10, 15 years, they were killing it. You know, they grew this business from nothing, um, into generating like 50 or $60 million revenue a year, right? Massive business. And one of the brothers had had enough, right? There was some sort of issue in the family. Didn't want to work with his other brother anymore. Wanted out. They did not have any structure in place, any documents to help them determine how to deal with this. And as a result, their only way out was through a lawsuit. So one brother sued the other brother, sued the company. They ended up spending, at least our client, over $150,000 in legal fees, $150,000. And it took almost three years. Okay. And at the end of it, the brother is like, don't even talk to each other, don't even acknowledge each other. The company itself had to get dissolved because it wasn't a legal entity that survived this issue. Families in turmoil, like it, it's awful. And all of that could have been avoided if, you know, at the very beginning or early on, they had put together uh, like an operating agreement, right? If you're an LLC that says, hey, if one member wants out, this is the process we follow. This is how we value their portion of the business and their wrap like that in place. And they would have spent $5,000 on an operating agreement instead of $150,000 on, on a lawsuit. Yeah, it's a lot of savings. And, uh, you know, take it, yeah. I, I've been in these experiences before where I've had business partners and they were, you know, uh, doing the same amount of work or, you know, there was a disagreement on some aspect of the business. And it becomes very sticky when yep. you don't have a really solid agreement because look, when the agreement is made, then both parties know exactly what they're responsible for. When it's not made, then everything becomes, oh, okay, I might do this, I might do this, maybe this is not worth my time, but there's no understanding of uh, responsibilities and delegations. That's, that's exactly right. Um, you know, I always tell people when you're starting a business with a partner or several partners, it's like getting married. Like this is a long-term commitment where you are going to be in contact with this person, you know, for the foreseeable future, you're going to have insight into their life. Like there's going to be ups and downs and you've got to try to figure out how to work through them. Cause if you don't like it ends in this ugly divorce, right. And everyone sort of loses in that situation, except the divorce attorneys, right. Or the litigation yeah. attorneys, they win. <laughs> yeah, they always win. yeah. Uh, but I don't do that. So I want to prevent that from happening for people. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, you gave a last year, you gave a lecture that I attended and you talked about some really interesting case studies on, you know, some really amazing things to do in a business and some really like things that you need to really avoid. Can you give us some other examples of, uh, of that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so obviously the, those two brothers are a great cautionary tale and why you should hammer out these details early and, you know, clearly, um, and hire someone to help you figure these things out. Um, yeah, I've, I mean, I've, I've, I've got another one, um, often overlooked, but, um, you know, a client of mine is a tech based on, entre- uh, startup, right. That does uh, 3d printing, super cool technology. Right. Um, and a lot of the, growth is around bringing in outside capital, right? Bringing in investors, venture firms, things like that. Well, the attorney that they had um, create the entity 
um, they didn't authorize enough stock in the company, right? So there's this difference between authorized stock and issued stock. Authorized is how many you tell, you know, the state the company has called a million. Issued is how many you actually give out to people, right? 500 to this person, 1,000 to this person. Well, they weren't paying any attention and they'd actually issued more stock than they had authorized, which is very like a huge problem because it invalidates then a lot of these agreements. And they had people contributing tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars to their business whose ownership stake is now in question. And so, you know, if they had had someone along the side of them sort of guiding them through this process, you know, that's where we jump in and say, listen, like, this is the issue. It's easy to fix. It really is if you do it in advance, right? We just authorize more shares. But as a result of that, they actually uh, missed out on funding from one investor, right? Because they found out and they're like, oh, like, this is indicative of how you run a business. You're not aware of the details. Don't ever want that. Yeah. Um, and then another round of money had to get pushed back until we fixed it. So um, that's, you know, that's another thing. Like there's just so many moving parts when you're an entrepreneur that if you try to do them all, right, try to be a master of them all, you're going to miss things. Yeah. And so that's where getting a, a reliable teammate in place to handle aspects of it, uh, you know, sort of lets you grow at an exponential rate rather than incremental. Awesome. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, I've, listen, I've got, I've got a bunch, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, people negotiating the purchase of a business before talking to, to me, this is actually a client of mine and they agreed to terms that were horrible <laughs> before they got me involved. But once those terms are agreed to, it's really hard to negotiate something different. So, you know, the deal went through on those terms and they had waived uh, like a due diligence contingency. Well, we found out that there were all these problems with like old equipment, bad contracts with vendors, and it ended up costing them like another $70,000 to fix after the fact. And we could have avoided that, you know, if, if I had been involved a little bit earlier. So those are, those are things that you kind of need to be aware of, um, you know, as an entrepreneur, there's a ton of excitement, right? Like, and I'm like, when you're starting your company, I'm going to guess you are excited to get it started. 100%. Absolutely. As you should be. And so the temptation is to be like, uh, just focus on the idea. Let's grow the business. Let's grow the business. Let's get our brand together. Let's get our name out there. Let's get customers, clients, hire a team, you know, let's get moving, uh, you know, the legal and accounting side, we'll do that later, right? That's a, cause that's an expense, you know, mm -hmm. that impacts my cash flow, all of these things. And, you know, that's, you know, tying into what we were talking about earlier is that if I'm doing my job right, I get viewed as a value add, not a cost center, Right. The things that I'm doing, the expense that, that you pay in legal fees or, or coaching fees or whatever it is, you know, the client looks at and they're like, oh, that was actually a really good deal. <laughs> like, I thought it'd be more expensive. I got a lot of value out of this. Um, that's the goal. But you've got to tap these people early because, um, you know, it's easy to push them, push it to the side. Right. Yeah, definitely. So you, you're saying that you have your consultant along with your uh, your attorney services. How do how do you wrap it up? Are paying people paying for a particular service, and then they get the coaching included? Is the coaching like a monthly subscription? How does it how does it work for you? Yeah, so it's there's like two two different models, but the most common is you know listen, you hire me, like you get the full <laughs> the full treatment, right? Um, it's, it's just one, one fee. It's not confusing. It's pretty straightforward, but you get everything, right? Like you want coaching help. Like I'm there providing some coaching, you know, setting up, uh, you know, like biweekly or monthly calls. They're just focused on, Hey, how do we achieve our strategic goals? Like, um, there's no legal components to it. Um, you know, it's about maximizing performance. Um, that it all comes wrapped into it. Now, 
if you don't necessarily want the legal fees, there's also just packages of, of coaching services and consulting services that, that, you know, I offer a lot of them are, you know, for six or 12 month periods, uh, because like all good things, uh, results take time. <laughs> yeah. when I was Change takes time sometimes. Yeah. And accountability is so important, especially as an entrepreneur, you know, um, yeah. there's this, mindset sometimes that okay we think we know everything but you don't know what you don't know and every yeah. time i run into something that is a little bit outside of my scape of wisdom then i have to start like scrambling to figure out the solution but if we can you know yeah. work with someone who can foresee some problems that might come up you know ahead in maybe like three months six months 12 months down the road then there's always planning involved and my philosophy in life is always be proactive about these things rather than reactive. Because when we're reactive, we think with our fear-based mind. And when we're proactive, right. we think an abundance mindset, um, which always gives us multiple options on how to, how to proceed. Yeah, that that's exactly right. I, um, I'm showing my age, but um, you know, entrepreneurs are Jim Carrey in the Truman Show. Mm-hmm. Like they've, they've got this, the world that they've created mm-hmm. and they, they live in it, right? And their perspective is all based on this this world. They don't realize that, you know, there's all these other risks, opportunities, you know, different ways of approaching the business, all kinds of things that exist outside this bubble. And sometimes it just takes someone from the outside world to give you that perspective to all of a sudden, you know, blow the bubble up or expand it. And that's really what I try to do on the on the coaching perspective. Yeah. And, you know, even if some things don't ever come to fruition, but you're going to be forced to expand your mind into like figuring out solutions for things. So it's just, it's just a good practice in self-development as an entrepreneur. That's what I think entrepreneurism is just like the ultimate (laughs) self-development because you you mostly got to improve yourself in order to become a business, better leader, a better entrepreneur, better business person. Um, So yeah, Yeah. I love the journey because it's never, never complete. It's always, always constantly evolving. It, it is. And I, I think that if you are, it's a, it's a lesson in humility too, right? Being an entrepreneur, because if you're being honest with yourself, you're exactly what you're saying. You realize like, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> like I'm going to make mistakes. Um, and you have to be willing to, to make them and learn from them and keep moving forward. Uh, but yeah, that's, <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah, dude. So uh, obviously during COVID uh, in the last year, a lot of business owners have struggled with a lot of different challenges. And yeah. um, I know a lot of people that their revenue is down. Some red people's revenues are up, you know, if they're, if they're in food service or other industries like PPE and all this kind of stuff. Right. What advice would you give, you know, general um, to entrepreneurs that are not doing as well as they were prior to COVID would you recommend diversification? Would you recommend they go even harder in the paint on like, you know, one, one uh, area of, you know, excelling or like, what is your, what is your take on that? That's, that's a great question. And it's honestly, it's going to be dependent on each entrepreneur, but it, it ties into, you know, what we're talking about with having a vision, right? If you know what your vision is, like be rigid there right? Double down on your vision, but be flexible on how you get there, right? So, you know, a a, a great example, there's a a pizzeria um, in Hudson County that obviously when COVID hit, all the restaurants shut down, can't really do anything. Uh, The revenue dried up. And, you know, this person's vision was to create the best pizza experience that he can. So, can't have people coming into the restaurant anymore. So what do you do? Thinking about he made make your own pizza kits, right? With a video and all the ingredients. So you could order it online. You go, you pick it up, watch the video. And it's like an instruction on how to create this really great pizza. So, you know, it's in line with his vision, right? Cause he's still helping people create pizza, you know, that that's, that's fantastic. He's not the one doing it anymore, but it opened up a whole new stream of revenue that he didn't have previously. So sometimes it's a fine line um, because you don't want to diversify yourself into non-existence, 
right? Because there, there's always attempts or a temptation to take like this shotgun approach where you're like, oh man, my main revenue stream is gone. Mm-hmm. Oh, I have these seven other ideas. I'm going to try them all. And they don't necessarily tie into one another. Um, they don't necessarily connect to your vision, right? They're not furthering your purpose. And all that that's going to do is, you know, pull on your energy, your resources, and it's going to be really hard to be successful in those things. So it's, it's not about reinventing or inventing new income streams. It's, it's about pivots, little pivots that are aligned to your, to your mission statement. So, you know, if you're one of those businesses, right, that that's challenged or exp- experiencing challenges in your revenue, listen, there's no bad time to pivot, right? It's just comes to our, our, the front of our mind when we're struggling, but you can do this when you're successful too. But it, it's, it's about creating complementary services or products, like I said, that are aligned with your overall strategies. So, you know, sounding like a broken record, but like, that's where having the strategic goals matter. That's where having the vision matters. That's where I, having partnerships with professionals who understand those goals is also important because they can help advise you and direct you on those things. Um, but yeah, I don't know. If I, I hope that answered your, your question. Yeah, totally. I'll give you another example. So like my cousin had a, uh, has a catering um, business. They do like Indian delicacies and sweets and they have a, a restaurant and all that stuff. And during COVID, everything was shut down. Um, their online business was doing okay, but the restaurants were really like non-existent. So they decided they have all this food in stock. Let's do grocery delivery. And then the grocery delivery soon became the most profitable part of the business and ways in which way they can ut- utilize their inventory. And then obviously as things started coming back, they were able to shift back. Um, I know a lot of other food delivery services yeah. that were able to do that. Another example is a good friend of mine. He has a lighting company. And for eight months during COVID, he was not able to sell one light because people were not investing in infrastructure at that time. Yeah. So he he pivoted into one of his business partners has a family in China. They were able to get uh, PPE contracts. And because they were so reliable, such a great brand in what they did um, serving like the, the police departments, the sheriffs in Jersey City, um, in hospitals, all this kind of stuff with their lighting, they were able to get in PPE when nobody else was able to just because leveraging their contacts. And that became their biggest source of revenue during that time, kept the business alive. Yeah. So, you know, we, we always got to look to see like what resources we have and then what resources do we need and how do we continually like, you know, not freaking give up, you know, when, when, when the cards or whatever are like, you know, low because yeah. there's always opportunities out there. We just have to look sometimes outside of our, our scape of uh, what we think we have to do. Yeah, you, that's that's absolutely right. There's always a, a temptation. I myself, like at any given time, there's like 15 ideas, right? For companies and things that I want to try. And there's always a temptation that when I hit a an obstacle in what I'm currently doing, that I'm like, oh, obstacle, I'm going to pivot to this new idea. Yeah. Right. And, and explore that and the talent, right. The insight comes in understanding is, is this obstacle and immovable one, right. Immutable that you're never going to be able to overtake, or is it just something that is hard? (laughs) Um, And most of the time, I mean, almost all of the time, it's just something that's hard. There's almost nothing that is, insurmountable. And so making, but understanding that difference is is crucial in knowing, are you pivoting away from a problem or are you pivoting to a new solution to the problem? And, And that, that distinction I think is, is vital because if you're pivoting away from a problem, listen, you're going to run that, that life forever. You're always, you know, every venture you start, when you hit a roadblock, and pivot to a new venture and you're never going to see the success that you know you deserve because there's never a path without obstacles but if you're pivoting to a new solution to get past that obstacle that's how you grow right that's how you experience you know great success in your ventures and that's again like i like i 
I tie everything back into this. That's where having a vision and having the strategic goals matter. How you get there is less important than getting there. Wonderful. Let's um, <clears throat> pivot into a little bit more about you, Trevor. Now, I know during, you know, especially with your background and your near-death experience, it kind of opened up your your mind, your heart, your spirit to living more. And during COVID, you did a lot of traveling, uh, whereas most people did not. And, you, you know, you visited places like Egypt um, and, you know, you saw that you explored like America, the national parks and everything like that. So tell us a little bit about your uh, rationale for making those decisions to, for traveling when everybody else is kind of like shutting down and, and staying put. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, and, and, and listen, for the first six months, you know, we, we did that. We were locked down in a bubble, not interacting with anyone, not leaving our apartment. I mean, we actually, you know, for like a month went uh, into Pennsylvania and rented a house because like three or four people in our building had COVID and like, we didn't know what to do, but we got to a certain point and, you know, I mean, maybe my perspective is a little different, but, um, my fiance is a physician. She still had to go into work. She was still seeing patients. They were taking all the precautions that they needed to, right? All the PPE, all the social distancing, disinfecting the whole nine yards. And none of their physicians were really getting COVID and weren't getting exposed. Meanwhile, like, well, we're free spirits. We love traveling. Like that was a big part of our life. We love socializing and being around people. You know, we were withering because we weren't living our lives, right? We were sacrificing so much. And so we kind of made the decision that we can't continue to live in stifling fear, right? There's a healthy fear out there. So we, we took the precautions because, you know, COVID is a serious thing. Like it's, it's something that we need to be aware of and we can't be stupid about, but I could get hit by a bus <laughs> crossing the street tomorrow. Uh, so there's calculated risk that you have to understand what you can and can't take. In my risk profile, I was willing to take some of those. So in August, you know, we decided to go visit my family in Montana. We flew out there, you know, wearing two masks and gloves and everything, but we still did it. You know, we went to Alaska to ch- check out Denali. You know, we're still abiding by the guidelines, but we just realized that if we let you know, sort of this fear of the unknown control our lives, we weren't going to have much of a life to, to live. <laughs> and we're just, we just weren't willing to do that. You know? So beautifully said, you know, I, I truly believe everybody, like you said, everybody has to take their own risk profile, their tolerance, it, you know, to mind and, you know, let everybody live the life that they want to live because we only have this one opportunity, you know, and for, for all those people that are saying, oh, you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. Like focus on yourself, focus on, you know, yeah. try to, try to not be in fear. And if you're in fear, then yeah, like take all the precautions, stay at home, do whatever you need to do. But for the people that are not living in fear, Hey, listen, you know, we don't want a year of our lives to go by two years of our lives to go by and not be able to experience this this beautiful life because as you know like it's so short and it could go at any moment and why not yeah. why not expand ourselves because the only like i look at it is we can either live in love which is an abundant mindset or we can live in fear mm-hmm. which is very closed minded mindset and scarcity mindset so you know we always get to to choose that every single day and every action every interaction every conversation we have Ab- absolutely and that's um you know that my experience in, in 2018, I was like, <laughs> listen, I had like, I wasn't expecting to flatline that day. It was a routine procedure. Like who knew that this could be something that happened. And so looking at, right. Looking at what risks we're willing to take, appreciating the fact that this can all be taken away from us at any moment. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that you need to be reckless, but there's, there's an abundance of things that can be done, you know, to, to experience life, especially right now. Um, And if you, if you're willing to, to take those steps and and do that, like there's a lot of, there's reward, right? There's, there's fulfillment and there's things that you can, you can sort of unlock about yourself during this time. Um, And, and and that's, yeah, 
that's the best I can do. Right. Cause I can't advise anyone on how to live their life and I really shouldn't be, but it's, if you live in fear, like you said, it's, it's sort of a one-way path to sort of a, a truncated life. There's listen, I'm, I'm going to get really nerdy on you if you're okay with this. Um, sure. cause I was a philosophy major. Um, <laughs> um, there's this concept, uh, coined by the Greeks by Aristotle called, uh, and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, but it's a uh, uh, eudaimonia. Okay, and uh, uh, just keeping track, E U D I A M O N I A, and it translates like the most common translation is called flourishing, and it's this idea that as any living being, like your job is to flourish, which is to be the best version of this living being, right? Whether you're a dog, right? Well, if a dog is to flourish, it needs to be the most dog-like it can be, right? And to be a human to flourish, you need to be the most human that you can be, right? To, To make use of all of our faculties, to really experience the life in only the way, you know, a a self-aware being can. And, you know, if that's sort of the purpose, you know, that, and that's the lens you use, you sort of analyze risk in a very different way. Like, am I going to be afraid of something that's limiting my, my ability to flourish? If I am, it must be a very big risk, right? It has to be a huge risk in my mind. If it's not, then I'm willing to accept it because flourishing is more important. Um, hopefully my philosophy professors aren't watching because I hope I didn't butcher that, but <laughs> we'll send an email out to all of them. No, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Professor Miller. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, Thank you for sharing that. Very, very powerful stuff. Now, Trev, why do you think you came here to earth as Trevor Anderson and what did you want to experience? Listen, I honestly, that ties right into that concept. I think that our purpose and mine in particular is to live the most human life that I can. Um, So for me, you know, that is um, exploration, adventure, critical reasoning, uh, community building. That's really what I think we should all sort of be striving for because we're all like social, you know, humans are social animals. And we have the ability to have critical thought and be self-aware and have these like intellectual conversations and really push the bounds of, of knowledge and experience. And I think that's why we're all kind of put here is to try to do that. I specifically feel like I was put here to pursue my why is to help people get to that point. Lovely. And what role does God or spirituality play in your life, if any? And what does it mean yeah. to you? So... Uh, loaded question because I have a I have a fun past with uh, with God and religion. I was raised uh, Roman Catholic uh, in the in the Midwest and always had questions. Um, I was a nightmare for my Sunday school teachers. <laughs> uh, you know, kind of left that faith. I had a stint in like a sort of the Christian non-denominational movements, you know, also asked too many questions for, for that particular community and kind of left that. So I would say that I, uh, yeah, I mean, right now I don't consider myself an atheist, but one who is always willing to change my stance, right. Based on what I, what I learn, what I see, what I experience, um, you know, and I, To say if there's a God, I have no idea, right? Spirituality, you know, believing in maybe something greater than yourself. I do, but I think it's like, you know, the laws of thermodynamics, you know, it's out there. But um, it's interesting because my, my, my perspective, you know, how we live our lives can be looked at like just a set of data, Mm -hmm. right? And then to, to put a value judgment on it. Did you live a good life, a bad life? whatever is a construct that we drop on top of it. Religion, a lot of times is that construct. And, you know, I've essentially 
removed religion and created my own constructs. I'm still making the value judgments. I'm not necessarily sure where they're coming from. Like they're definitely influenced by, you know, the Judeo-Christian model. But yeah, I, I'm not quite sure. What about you? It's a good question, man. So what God means to me is uh, it is just this intelligence that created all of this beauty, you know, and yeah. knowing that I am a part of it and that you are a part of it and that everyone is a part of it, even the people that do bad, like we need an entire spectrum and a range of what negative negative is and what really positive is. And we get to be in this planet, you know, this 3D reality, and maybe we go into 4D soon, who knows, but it's, it's showing us the entire range of what's out there. And it's, it's everything, right. And, um, you know, one of the coolest things is like when I, when I had one of my psychedelic experiences, and by the way, I invited you last time we got together for, for lunch, if you ever want to join me and, uh, you know, maybe open I up, definitely do. It, it might open up some things and give you some kind of, uh, another perspective on all of this, but um, it just showed me how what's inside of our minds is actually larger when what this universe even has, right? So like there's so much uh, limitless potential within us. Like what makes a person like Elon Musk uh, do the things that he's able to do versus someone who's not doing those things and very limited in their thinking. It's just their thinking, right? Uh, Maybe there's some opportunities and whatnot. Yes, absolutely. But um, you know, if you ever seen that Goodwill Hunting movie, it was based on a, a guy who was a janitor and, you know, he, he became this like mathematician. It was based on a true story, actually. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there, there's always um, th- there's just that that quest for limitless is that's what this life for me is all about. And the more I go inward, the more I understand about how to how to create this outward reality, because it really is. I believe that we're living in a spiritual realm and mm-hmm. yeah, we're just playing it out on a, on a physical plane right now. Yeah. I, I mean, listen, I, I agree with that. I think a, a lot of the, the limitations that we experience as people are just manifestations of our beliefs. You know, I, I think that our mind is incredibly powerful um, and that's limitless, you know, in its potential. And, you know, if, if we're not, if we're not constantly willing to bring in new data new experiences then we impose a limit on ourselves um you know kind of to tie this in because you brought it up you know when i went to egypt for example i saw things there that absolutely blew my mind like you know the great pyramid (sighs) listen it's it's tough to explain right it boggles the mind it's uh rationally impossible Mm-hmm. right like we still don't really know how they were created i don't know if we will but someone did right some person made this and that's a reflection i think of a a culture of people whatever it is that had that had removed a limit right in their in their social construct that we currently have in our in our own and so you know, I don't necessarily know what that is, but that's, that's an example to me of like, the, the potential is there, right? The limitations are self-imposed. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting to think that way because, you know, you really become the master of your own, your own destiny, right? The master of your own outcomes. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it's really important to uh, monitor what, what comes into our mind because, yeah, we're, you know, say we're these beings and we want to take a shower, right? And if the shower, this water is just all muck and dirt and like, you know, just nonsense coming into our, on, on our body and we're bathing in it, uh, you know, and you take the example of fear in society through all the, you know, the, the news media, the politics, the division, all that stuff. And we're bathing in that constantly that's the reality that we create in our in our physical reality now if we turn all that off and then we start reading philosophy or emerson or thoreau or you know even like some spiritual texts um that talk about love and light and all this kind of stuff and we're bathing Mm -hmm. in that then that's the reality that we create that's the community that we create right so it's up to individually the input and then what we put out so we're really a reflection of all all of the inputs and the outputs that we that we have you know our brains are a receiver and a transmitter so you know we have to take responsibility for for all of it because that's really what we have the only 
choice we have in this life is how we think. And um, don't let it, don't let our thoughts be influenced by outside forces that want to form your mind into hate filled or fear filled uh, person. Yeah, I absolutely. And I mean, that's, you know, uh, not to, not to force an analogy, but like that translates very well to people who, you know, are launching a new venture with a unique idea is that there are so many negative forces that will work on you if you allow them to. Mm -hmm. I mean, because, you know, for better or worse, we live in a fear-based society. And so, you know, there's people who are going to tell you, you can't do it. People who will say you shouldn't do it. And if that's who you surround yourself with and take that in, like you're going to be limited because you're going to reflect their fears, Mm -hmm. you know, but if you start surrounding yourself with people who encourage you, believe in it, you know, support it, then, then you start believing it as well. Right. Like it's, there's a lot of power to what you're saying. Beautiful brother. I really want to thank you for, for coming on. That was such a great uh, conversation. So much, uh, so much was discussed. And uh, I think it's very powerful for, for everyone who's going to listen. It really helped me on a lot of levels. So I want to thank you so much, Trev. How can we learn more about you? Uh, yeah. Uh, again, thank you. A pleasure to be here. Love our conversations. Um, y- you can find me on Instagram. It's, uh, let's hear the Anderson firm dot PC. Uh, you can visit my website, which is tafpc.com. Uh, you can always give me a call, 551 551- Two two zero four four one nine. I've got an office here in Jersey City, so yeah, that or find me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, Trevor Anderson, the Anderson Firm PC is a uh, is a page there. So uh, happy to answer any and all questions. You know, anyone has about what we've talked about today. Uh, you know, if they have questions about their business uh, goals, you know, strategic goals that they're trying to accomplish. Um, any challenges that they're facing, or if they just want to talk to me about Aristotle, that's cool too. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So for anyone who's, who's listening, there's going to obviously see the vision, the passion, and the, the heart that you put into everything that you do and the way you communicate. So if you're a new business owner or even an existing business owner that is looking to up level, Trev is certainly the guy. So, so hit him up. And uh, you know, that's how we, that's how we grow in this community is we, we support one another. So that's right. Yeah. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Awesome, bro. Thank you so much.